today, BSD Now, we finally hit 30 episodes. Very awesome. Today, we're going to be chatting with Warren Block to discuss BSD documentation efforts and future plans. If you've ever wondered about the scary world of mailing lists, today's tutorial is going to show you the basics on how you can get involved, how you can help and can contribute back. There's lots to go and get in today, so let's sit back and enjoy some BSD Now, the place to be, SD. Episode 30, Documentation is King, recorded March 26, 2014. Hey, I'm your host, Chris Moore. And I'm Alan Jude. We're glad to have you guys with us this week. We got a bunch of cool stuff coming at you. We got a live tutorial and, uh, of course, an interview a little later. But first, let's get right into the headlines for the week. So uh, what's going on with uh, OpenBSD and some sun that I'm hearing about here, Alan? Uh, yes. Uh, Ted Unangst, who uh, we talked to a couple weeks ago on the show, mm-hmm. Uh, has yeah. just uh, done a port to get uh, the Spark 64 version of OpenBSD running on a Sun T5120, uh, okay. which apparently is an inexpensive uh, Spark 64 machine that uh, people can still get. Oh, interesting. Okay. It also apparently has some built-in virtualization support. Oh, that's kind of neat. So he uh, wrote about that and kind of goes through some of the quirks and steps that you'll have to go through in case you're interested in running on one of these uh, fine older Spark machines. He's also got another cool post that's related about running on a Dell CS24-SC server, which might be of uh, use if you have one of those laying around Mm -hmm. and plan on uh, bringing a BSD up on it. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, uh, next up, we have Info Beehive 2014 videos are up. Wow, that was quick. Uh, They were actually uh, up like... The next morning after. <laughs> oh, so we could have mentioned them last week. Okay. Yeah, well, well the show was already maybe. full last week. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay, well, cool. Well, for those who haven't seen them yet, the videos from BeehiveCon 2014, which uh, happened uh, last uh, week in Tokyo. Uh, two weeks ago, now, yeah. Two weeks ago now, yep, are now available. Um, we have the links in the show notes here to YouTube where you can go out and watch them. So it was kind of like an impromptu conference for Asia BSD Con. How did they, who organized this, Alan? Um, the guy that posted the YouTube videos, uh, Takuya Asada. Okay, so uh, local organized it. Yes, and uh, he managed to find a, a room for us. Uh, a local internet research company had a meeting room that they lent us, and there were about uh, 50 people that signed up on some Japanese website that's kind of like meetup.com. <laughs> sure. Sure. And uh, he organized a bunch of speakers and, and we had a little day conference. It was pretty good. Uh, oh, very cool. Peter Graham was there and gave his talk, uh, BSD Past, Present, and Future, kind of mm-hmm. overview from back when the project started at. Uh, you mean Beehive, right? Yeah. Be- when Beehive okay. started back at uh, Meet BSD and uh, up through what it has today and what they plan on adding in the next while and and what they still needs to be done and so on. Uh, I gave a little talk about uh, getting rid of Linux servers by throwing them into Beehive. Hey, there you go. Uh, Our host, uh, Takuya, gave a talk, uh, the introduction to Beehive. Uh, It kind of explains Mm -hmm. what it is and how it works. Um, He also gave a talk from where he works, uh, where he works with OSV, uh, which is a way hmm. to, um, instead of running an entire operating system in the virtual machine, you have a kernel and you load your application into Correctly. it. And uh, oh. it, you basically execute the app you're trying to run as if it was an operating system. That's really cool. And he also showed off, uh, he implemented a very basic version of Beehive using its library in Ruby. <laughs> so it's Ruby dash virtual machine and it uses the uh, lib VMM API that mm-hmm. Beehive is built on, but replaces the Beehive command line utility with this bit of Ruby script. And it just That's cool. injects a small chunk of uh, assembly code into the virtualizer and, and runs it. But it's all implemented in Ruby. Uh, they were talking about using that for like automated testing. Yeah, uh, right? Peter Green was really interested in that for uh, regression testing and things like that. Oh, that's cool. And there were a bunch of other talks, including uh, ones about um, some other uh, virtualization stuff, like uh, Cubes OS, which is um, a fork of Zend, uh, specifically mm-hmm. looking at security. 
and sure. uh, Mo Cloudos, uh, which was how much work would it be to design an entire virtualization system in 14 days? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, That's probably a fair amount of work. Yes, a bunch of cool stuff like that, though. Cool. Well, of course, uh, you'll have to go check out the video if you want to get all the cool details mm -hmm. and see what you missed in Tokyo a couple weeks back. So again, hit up the YouTube link in the show notes afterwards. And uh, next up, we have building a FreeBSD wireless access point. So I guess we've had several of these. This one's FreeBSD based. Mm -hmm. So who wrote this one, Alan? Um, it just says Tom at Kuba.com. So it's a new blog post about creating a wireless access point with yeah. FreeBSD. Uh, apparently uses the wand board. Uh, okay. Um, and the the guy who did it uh, is apparently uh, one of the committers for Crochet, which is a toolkit or framework for building embedded device images. Sure. Uh, so he shows how he uses it there. Uh, and then yep. apparently the wireless interface on this particular board uh, he used a Cisco AE1000 wireless interface. Yep. And it, that uses the RUN driver on FreeBSD. Okay. And so he just shows how he set it up and yeah, edit scan. Lots and lots of host AB configuration, mm -hmm. yeah, typical rc.conf, and then, of course, uh, the all-powerful PF mm -hmm. configuration. Yeah, it looks pretty straightforward, though. This doesn't look too difficult to do. No. Oh, very cool. I might have to get around to building one of these. Man, there's so many choices. That's the problem, right? right. You know, I mean, it was bad enough when you had consumer routers to choose from. And yeah. now it's like, well, do I put open on here? Do I put free on here? Do I, you know, what little device do I put it on? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but is, you know, someone else's experience as far as, you know, which wireless thing actually works is yeah. probably pretty useful. Yeah, I'd be curious. I'm not sure if I see any comments, if you had any issues with the Wi-Fi driver or how well Well, I think he uh, particularly picked that Cisco thing because it's known to work. <laughs> Known, known to support everything. Good. <laughs> good deal. Okay. Well, but good yeah, there's uh, plenty of uh, config files and example firewall rules and all the messy details. Uh, yep. All kinds of good stuff. Cool. Okay. Next up, our new story is switching from Synology to FreeNAS. Yes. So, uh, ooh, new article. What's this one about? I mean, aside from what the title says. Right. Uh, so the author was uh, considering getting a NAS and uh, wasn't quite sure. Uh, where to do so he or what, which one to get uh so he documented his research as he went through doing it uh mm -hmm. he's looking at uh convenience versus flexibility <clears throat> you know um uh, some of them are easier to use but you, then you don't get as many options and trading off between those and also trading off between getting a device like buying an appliance versus actually building mm -hmm. a machine and installing software on it Sure. Uh, he says, after seeing the potential security issues with proprietary NASs, like we've talked about with the Netgear and the HP and a bunch of other ones, where they yep. there's a problem with the firmware and they're like, well, that's a two-year-old model, so we're not going to fix it <laughs> and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and dealing with the frustration of trying to get bugs fixed, you know, you find something wrong, but again, that's a two-year-old model, so you could buy the sure. new one <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, so he goes into some detail and, and looks at the different things. Uh, but in the end, he decided uh, to go with FreeNAS since he'll be able to upgrade the software on it as he goes through and, and make whatever changes. And and it's not just going to go away on him all of a sudden. Well, that's cool. That sounds like a pretty neat article here. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, speaking of FreeNAS, actually, that's, I suppose, a good transition to the next segment. We're going to talk a little bit about our sponsor for the week. Yes. So our sponsor for the week, as usual, IX Systems, mm -hmm. ixsystems.com slash bsdnow specifically. If you'd like to hit up that link and uh, get some information on building a server for open source, uh, you know, fill out the docs. You can get in touch with somebody who will definitely hook you up with the system specific to your needs. Yes. But I think there's some specific things we can talk about with them this week. I'll, yeah, there's uh, uh, so quite a few. One? Uh, well, one is, okay. uh, as we've mentioned before, they happen to be the people... Uh, helping manage the FreeNAS project yep. and keeping that going. And so they've just released uh, FreeNAS 9.2.1.3, uh, which was in okay. beta last week, but is now fully released. Uh, yep. And they have uh, a bunch of updates. Uh, specifically, they've upgraded the Samba support to 416 and solved the problem yep. where Samba was using a lot of CPU. Uh, they upgraded the NetATOC, which is the Apple file sharing protocol, uh, they also did a bunch of stuff with their ZFS replication status, 
is yep. now there's an actual UI for that. And they fixed a bug that was preventing the FTP daemon from starting uh, when logging to the system database. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good one to get fixed. Yep. And of course, though, we would like to mention that they use Intel stuff, right? Yes. Lots of Intel CPUs in their free NAS yes. minis to their mega, mega servers they build. Yep. Um, they use yeah, all the latest of, Intel hardware. And uh, all the latest Intel speaking hardware. of the latest crazy Intel hardware, uh, mm -hmm. Remember we talked about that mega core server that they built for the FreeBSD yep. Foundation with like 80 cores and a terabyte of yeah. RAM and stuff. Well, they built something else now, and it's the craziest machine I've ever seen, and I want it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they built what they call mega port, which at first I mega thought was going to be for cross-compiling ports or something. But no, uh, yeah. it means something entirely different. So they had some other customer uh, who needed uh, had a specific networking requirements. And right. so they got this uh, 2U server that actually has four computers in it. So there's uh, four one half u nodes. Uh, and each node has six 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. Holy crap. Yeah. And each of the nodes also has dual 10-core Intel CPUs, yeah. giving another 80 cores again. <laughs> yeah, so it's 80 cores in one box, although it's oh, actually yeah. split between four separate computers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but... But in one chassis. Yeah, it uh, each one <laughs> comes with 256 gigs of RAM for a terabyte total, and each has six 10 gigabit ports. Uh, four are Intel SFP Plus 10 gigabit controllers, and then two yep. of them are the Intel X540 uh, Copper RJ45 ports. So a that's backwards compatible with one gigabit, and mm -hmm. you know so you got four fiber ports and two copper ports. Uh, giving you a total of 24 10 gigabit ports in a 2U chassis. Dang. Along with 80 is... cores and a terabyte of RAM. Well, they had to call it Megaport because you can't just call everything the beast. Right, you know, yes. It gets old after exactly. a while. <laughs> but that is a lot of ports, you know. That is incredible. That's uh, so much gigabits. Yeah, there's, there's for those who can't see, when, uh, when you look at the show notes afterwards, we have the link, but yeah. uh, they have pictures. You know, yeah, like but the geek uh, you, form, you, can, you can see the inside. You can pull out each of the the sleds that, and you can see the the CPU and and the RAM. They got this yep. jammed full of components, as much as you could fit in there. Oh, that is incredible. Yeah. So let's see. Each one's twenty core. That would make a really good port building cluster, though. Yeah, well, you probably you probably don't need twenty four gigabit or twenty four ten gigabit ports on a port building no. machine. Yeah, without the NICs, but yeah. dang, you know, having the four systems in one one box with yeah. Each well, 24s, with uh, Pudrier, you, yeah. you'd probably want something more like the four way one where you have all the cores in one machine instead, but. Well, no, I'm thinking more like where I'll have a, a system building on 10 and one building on 11. Oh, one well, building yeah, on that eight. works. Although you can actually run those concurrently, I found, with Poudreire. Oh, okay. As long as you're well, not is... using the same jail twice. Sure. Then you can, I, I compiled for 9.2 and 10 for the same set at the same time. Oh, very cool. It's like, nah, 48 jails. I, I think, <laughs> I'm thinking more of going to like 11 because right. in order for me to build 11, I have to be running on an 11 host yeah. and I don't want to upgrade my main builder yeah. to 11. Uh, okay. I don't want to stick with 10 release for now. Yeah. But yeah, still that. Well, that's, I've been poking the guys box. that uh, do Beehive to increase the maximum number of CPUs you can create in a Beehive up above Ooh. 16. Although nice. apparently you can just recompile it well after you change the number, but there's some oh, okay. issues with going with really big numbers. But I only need change to go to 24, so it's not a big, big deal. But well, apparently is IX is also working on something else. Uh, ooh, ooh, secret stuff. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, we'll see more pictures soon. Uh, okay. But yeah, they say this is a good example of the kind of custom solution that IX system specializes in building for their clients. Yep. You know, they don't just have a set of servers and you can pick one and buy it one of the things they do is you know tell us what your problem is and we will custom design something that didn't exist before in order yep. to make it work like for example this crazy machine with 24 10 gigabit ethernet ports yeah. they like the engineering challenges like <laughs> yes, that i think that, that's what makes their job interesting otherwise yeah, it's just building servers like we, all day we've not done one like that before let's figure out how to do that yeah it's like that how are we gonna cool get that many gigabit ports that's you know that many just nicks in a machine is crazy but having all of them be 10 gig that's very i don't cool. even want to know what that costs 
<laughs> yeah, the, they, they conveniently left that off. Yeah, but I'm well, sure. <laughs> a, a dual port X4 or X540 is like eight hundred dollars or something like that. Yep. That's for the two copper ports. I don't know the ones with the the SFP Plus modules and stuff. Still, that's, that's really cool. They they yeah. can get a hold of those and build them any way you need them. Yeah. So and, again, we and the other it. big oh, thing is that they test it and make sure it works with oh, yeah. your BSD or Linux or whatever you want to put on it before they ship it. And, and that's they're gonna just, have a rigorous burn in. Yeah. You know, and that that's why I actually have a quote pending with them right now. We're going back and forth to designing a machine for my basement. <laughs> Yep. Yet another storage server. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, we do want to mention the URL again, ixsystems.com slash BSD now. And uh, when you go on there, just mention that you found them on uh, BSD now and that you appreciate them supporting the show because yep. they, they bring this kind of cool content out to you guys in the public. So yep. And they have a we, little... We really appreciate them. They have the guide that explains why you should consider using them because... Yep. For example, if you're the IT guy, you already know you want to use IX systems, but you have to sure. explain it to your boss. And yeah. that's where that pamphlet comes in handy. Here's actually, the business case yeah. on why this makes sense. It's like, here's a bunch of things you can put in the requirement that your other vendor won't be able to do. Mm -hmm. well, very cool. Yep. Well, uh, yeah, again, if you hit that URL, just let them know we sent you and uh, we would appreciate that. Well, cool. Well, we'll be back in just a moment with our interview for the week with Warren Block. Okay, and we're joined now by Warren Block of the FreeBSD Documentation Project. Glad to have you with us today, Warren. Well, thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we always love talking about docs. I think it's one of those things that sometimes gets overlooked but is really, really critical to the project. But uh, we're going to get into all that with you. So before we do that, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you first get into the whole BSD scene? Well, in uh, 1998, uh, I had someone give me a machine that a local repair shop had, had diagnosed had had some catastrophic failure. Uh, it was it was shot, and anything you attached to it would be destroyed, is what they said. Sure. And so a friend of mine said, you know, I think you'd like free, free BSD. Let's put it on there. And that particular machine was my server for another three or four years. Uh, it was fine. It worked. And I mean, this was Pentium 2 class hardware, dirt cheap, mail order, ran ultra reliably. Mm -hmm. hmm. And so I've been using it uh, ever since. Wait, that specific? Oh, okay, not that specific machine, uh, FreeBSD ever since. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, what hats do you wear for the FreeBSD project? What kind of things do you do? Oh, and I should say I have some illustrations here. Oh. So. Nice. I will show these from time to time just so it's a little, <laughs> a little less dull. Uh, nice. I am a documentation committer. Uh, I write and edit docs, which is kind of a big job, but uh, somebody's got to do mm -hmm. it. I occasionally submit patches to other, other parts of the system involving not only docs, but sometimes like RC startup scripts and stuff. I don't do much C, but occasionally. Mm -hmm. And I am fairly active as a member and one of the moderators of the FreeBSD forums. Okay. Well, that is really cool. So how did... And I've got an oh, entirely manual system. You'd think with a computer I could do this better, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's too many things to click and, and stuff to do. It's just easier to draw, it, right? All right. So how did you become a developer and more recently a member of the Doc ENG team? Okay. Um in 2001, I've got to get this to where you can read the captions because some of these are metaphorically clever, but I don't know that they'll actually show that. I thought they were clever. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2001, uh, I wrote some software for a free BSD server at a company, and then I wrote the docs for it in Word because we were a Windows. I mean, we used Windows for the desktop. Sure. And what I found was Word, after about 100 pages, would corrupt the file and not be able to load it again. Oh, that's nice. And, of course, I was using FreeBSD for this other software and had built the handbook from source using the, the FreeBSD doc tool chain. And it built it. It built an HTML version. It built a PDF version. It was exactly what I wanted. And I thought, you know, why don't I see if I can use that? And I did, and it worked perfectly. It was faster than Word, it was easier than Word, and it looked better. So 
that gave me uh, a fair amount of experience in writing these doc book documents, which were SGML at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still close enough. And so then I started submitting patches and didn't do an awful lot, uh, but then became more involved with it lately. And in uh, 2011, uh, Glenn Barber and Benedict Reusling, uh submitted me for a commit bit, and then they were my my mentors. Sure. And then got the bit itself, and uh, I believe it was early 2012. All right. Some sometime around then. And then, as far as the uh, documentation engineering team, I'm still very new at that. Um, the official tasks of that team are to approve new doc committers and maintain the primer, the doc, FreeBSD documentation primer, to make sure it, uh, it corresponds with everything and is up to date. And then to work on uh, translation systems. And beyond all that, I, I think I would, again, I'm new at this, but I would sum it up as saying, just make sure the docs are kept in good working order. Sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, who else is on the Doc Eng team? Um, I have another illustration here. I will run out of these after a while, but uh, <laughs> the current members are Glenn Barber, which I know many people know, and those who don't know should appreciate his work mm -hmm. because he does a lot of things. Uh, Hiraki Sato, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Fonvier, Gabor Kovistan, and of course myself. And as far as I understand it, there aren't really any fixed roles at this point. Uh, the, the team members are kind of spread around the planet, and part of that is nice because they're all in different time zones. So if there's some uh, questionable problem with the website docs or sure. something else, hopefully there will be somebody who's awake and can address it quickly. Yeah, that's good thinking. So now that you're a member of Doc uh, Engineering, what's your master plan? Where are you going with this? Uh, well, first, of course. <laughs> Let's see here. First, of course, is taking over the world. Okay. I mean, that kind of goes without saying. Ultimately, my, my goals are to make documentation as accessible as possible, and I mean that in several ways. I want to make it easier to write. Uh, we've sure. had – there are things that make it difficult to do a good job just communicating the message, and those can be improved. And then I want to make it easier to read. We have – Oh, we have all kinds of, of clarity and redundancy things that can be improved. Sure. And then also, I'd like to make it easier to obtain the docs in a reader's native language. Ooh, and that, that's we have areas where we can improve it. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of the things you think that are currently lacking and how could we make the documentation better? Well, I would say... Um, the way, you, the way to look at that is look at what we do well uh, first. And the things we do well, we do the handbook and our other formal documentation. It's great. We do a good job on that. We do the man pages also are very good. And sure. the framework for all that stuff was set up by some very smart people quite a long time ago. And it kind of shows how smart they were that it has worked so well for so many years. Uh, hmm. The man pages, I think, are a particular advantage. And some of the other uh, open source projects are, in, in just the last few years, have kind of come around to realize how, how useful those can be. They're not a replacement for instructions. They're kind of a, a quick reference, reference sheet. Yeah. And right. the handbook and other articles are quite good. Uh, there are a lot of little things we can do to improve uh, all of it. And I, I call these challenges. They're not problems, really. They're challenges. Sure. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is get all users. I, I, every time I see somebody say, they should fix this, there's a problem with this, and they should fix it, I would like to get people to say, we should fix it. Because sure. that, uh, that buy-in to becoming a member of the project, or at least realizing that anybody who uses it is a member, and can help to make improvements is extremely important. And that, it sounds like a little thing, but it could make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, other simple little things we could do, every man page should have an example. 
And I say trivial examples are better than none, and good sure. examples are better yet. Mm -hmm. But there are so many things where even just a trivial example can give you a clue of how it works, and it might not be a, uh, obvious otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, another simple thing that uh, Drew Levine has been editing a lot of the handbook lately, doing a lot of good work. And another thing that she and I have tried to work on is we have a lot of chapters in the handbook that are really big. I mean, advanced networking is huge. Uh, the XORG chapter is just big. And the problem with having them that big is that a first-time user, say, somebody who's trying to figure out how to use their wireless card to connect to uh, the wireless at the hotel they're staying at, they're not sure. interested in 90% of the information in that chapter, and they have trouble with it because it kind of hides, it obscures the information they are looking for. Well, yeah, like, And uh, so we've been trying to add these uh, quick start sections. Uh, what is the most common problem people will be looking for an answer to? And we'll put that at the start. Not a lot of detail, just here's what you need to do to get your wireless working. And then if they want detail, it will be farther in the chapter. And that's something that it's not terribly difficult to do. It's just uh, some a little project that can make a big difference. Sure. Yeah. Uh, part of it, I think, is that the table of contents only goes so deep. Uh, and so if you have a really big chapter, you end up with sub, 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 sub chapters, and then they're not right. in the index. Uh, we have a lot of chapters where there's so much content in them, they really ought to be broken up yeah. into separate chapters. Uh, the advanced networking one is like that. Uh, there's just, there are some things that are worth a chapter in themselves. Mm -hmm. And part of that uh, that we can do for the long term is just recognize that and kind of have a framework uh, for the future for that. So when we make additions to that, say, you know, I think in the future we're going to be splitting this up and we will try and make sure that things are uh, reusable in that sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, little projects again, weasel words. I try, I know I've annoyed some people over this, uh, documentation. I hate it when it says should, because mm -hmm. most of the time the word should is a weasel word, meaning I'm not really sure it, it should work like this. Yeah. Well, or you should do this, supposed but to be telling yeah. me this, if you're yeah. not sure, then uh, I'm not sure I should uh, I should believe what's being said. Yep. And there are a lot of those uh, weasel words and also uh, passive voice. You should do this. Well, why not just say do this? Sure. That's easier for people to understand, easier for translators. Uh, and that, again, that's a relatively small one. Uh, for, uh, oh, and I also wanted to mention that... Uh, we should encourage the idea that docs are part of a program. They're not an add-on. They're not an optional extra. They should be considered part of it, uh, which, for the most part, OpenBSD does. And we need to emulate that and just make sure that uh, try to get that to be more acknowledged in FreeBSD. Yep. Cool. Uh, I, I mentioned for the larger projects, uh, reorganization of the handbook. That's not uh, a quick project that will be that will take some time and it won't happen overnight uh, our translation system needs an overhaul we have mm -hmm. translators who do a tremendous job and with essentially zero assistance from the computer and part of that is due to again the age of the project that was set up many years ago but we need to improve that to make it easier for the translators we already have and to attract new ones Sure. Um, because many times the uh, translation teams are your first contact in a country. They're the, the first serious users of a system. And so that would help uh, the project as a whole. So I, I do feel bad about the amount of work our, our translators have to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we're going to be talking about that at BSD Camp. Oh, um, cool. And, and then finally, as far as big jobs, we need to encourage doc committers, and I've been guilty of this. Uh, we need to encourage them to propose and mentor new doc committers. Uh, yep. That's uh, that's how the community grows. And I know it's it's like somebody comes up to you and says, "Can you help me fix this?" It's like, well, 
it's quicker if I just fix it for you. But mm-hmm. that's not a, a maintainable solution. Right. Uh, sure. It's not as good as teaching them to, how to do it and then getting them as a committer where they can help with other stuff. Uh, and we need to encourage that. Cool. Well, uh, changing gears a little bit, what's this Igor thing that you made? Explain oh, that, that to us. <laughs> that's a story of laziness and jealousy. Uh, okay. No slide for that? Come on. Uh, no. No, I have a few left, but I'm saving them. Uh, it started when uh, uh, my mentors, Glenn Barber and Benedict Reichling, we were talking about uh, checking white space in documents, which is, it should be a trivial thing. I mean, white space is invisible. Spaces and tabs, like at the end of a line, and in most editors, you can't see those. But uh, we want to have our documents as correct as possible, both in form and content. And so I'm lazy. I'm a programmer, and I consider laziness an asset. Uh, And I'm also jealous of, like, C compilers, which will tell you, hey, you've defined this variable, but you've never used it. Uh, We're going to optimize away all this stuff you did because it really can be replaced with nothing. There is nothing like that for writing text. Uh, And so between the two of those, that laziness and jealousy, I wrote a program in Perl that's sort of semi-modular. It checks everything that I could write checks for, uh, write tests for, in uh, text files or MDoc man page documents or mm-hmm. DocBook XML documents, uh, which also covers uh, XHTML, like the, uh, the vulnerabilities file that is used by package for checking for vulnerability security uh, security problems and i mentioned that it is in perl but i i have been trying to uh talk somebody into rewriting it now for a couple of years and so far i haven't antagonized anybody enough to actually take the hook but it wouldn't bother me if somebody rewrote it in any particular language python or scheme or ruby i don't care uh, the, uh, the whole point would be to do a better job of it. And I'm sure that sure. a better job can be done. I just have to talk somebody into it. Mm-hmm. It seems to work pretty good, actually. <laughs> it, yeah. so, it does some things. I would like to see it do more. Right. Sure. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about what kind of mistakes that it does catch? Uh, it's, uh, it's domain specific. I mean, it detects the type of a document. Uh, and then it looks for the rules that apply to that type of document. A text file, there aren't many rules. I mean, you might check for white space and spelling. Uh, an MDoc document for a man page, there's a certain set of commands or uh, definitions in in there that should occur in a certain order, and it checks for those. It checks for problems like, that I usually forget, like when you update a man page, you're supposed to upda- update the date in it. And sure. I... I forget that every time because you don't change that date until you're ready to commit it. So having a program to check for that is, is handy and helps me. I tell people it, it, it changes the standard commit process from commit, apologize, fix, recommit (laughs) to just commit. It removes those extra steps. Mm -hmm. Uh, for docbook documents, it checks for, Oh, uh, a bunch of things. Uh, one thing that people often get wrong is title capitalization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not just in DocBook stuff that happens. It happens everywhere. It's like, do you capitalize the word the? Mm, sometimes. Sure. And I can have Igor do the AP style tests on uh, titles and say, hey, here's how you should capitalize it. Uh, and it tests for... Indentation, which is a non-trivial problem for XML files for our docbook stuff, yeah. and I would really like to have somebody rewrite that one. Uh, it tests for two long lines. We're supposed to wrap lines at 70 columns. It tests for sentences starting with two spaces, which is a big bone of contention, except that that's what our rules have. Yeah. And that has actually been beneficial because uh, people don't argue about it much anymore. Because they fix it, it before like they commit it instead where, of... Sure. Where you uh, you run it and it says, "Hey, these are problems." And what I, my experience has been, people will typically fix those even if they disagree, just to shut up the program that's complaining about. <laughs> it's nagging me. Go away. Yep. 
Cool, so cool. right, and I've told people, I, I'm from a different era, I guess. In the old Amiga days, there was a program called GOMF, G O M F, called Get Out of My Face, which would effectively make, uh, just, it would hide system panics, mm-hmm. and I try and reference that, but nobody knows what that is. Anyway. <laughs> oh, he remembers that. Oh well. Uh, the the whole point of Igor is to have an assistant. It's like if you could have a, a personal editor where you could write this stuff and say, here, look this over before I, I commit it or even try to build it, that's what I want to have it do. It doesn't do that yet, but it finds a lot of these things that can be, they're a distraction. Yeah. If you have to worry about the white space and punctuation and all that while you're writing, it distracts you from the job, which really should be making a clear communication of what you're trying to say. Sure. And that's kind of the point of having it. Ultimately, I would really like to have it do sentence and paragraph analysis, like saying, hey, this sentence doesn't make much sense, or these <laughs> two sentences could be switched, or this one's too long. And in fact, uh, hmm. just a few weeks ago, I saw a website called HemingwayApp.com, hmm. which will analyze your writing and try and make it more like the work of Hemingway, <laughs> which was he used short, simple words and simple sentences. And that is pretty much what we want for documentation. It's easy to understand. It's easy to translate. Yeah, it may not be uh, big works of literature, but that's not what we're trying to, to get. Well, that's not the goal of documentation. N- nuance is nice, but and, it doesn't work so well when you have to translate it into 40 languages. Right. You can do very yeah. artistic writing. I mean, you can do Shakespeare-like works and you could do those for computer documentation, but it, it makes it really difficult for translators and also really difficult for people who are just trying to figure out how a program works, not try and read it as a literary work. Right. Uh, ultimately, I would really like to integrate those checks into an editor because, I mean, it could be checking that while you're, you're working on mm-hmm. it. Uh, I don't know how feasible that is. Uh, there have not been any serious efforts, but I'm interested in hearing from people on that too. I'll have to look at that. I have that the neat. editor I use has support for running like a lint check. Like you can, Plug in or yeah. Something. So like if you're writing PHP, it can run it through a lint check or Perl or, you know, it does all these languages. I wonder if I could make it do Igor for duck book. Some, uh, some editors do things like that already. I mean, consider spelling checks that are live. I mean, a, mm-hmm. a word that it doesn't think is spelled right is highlighted in red. That kind of stuff could be checked. Or the correct indentation for our docbook XML files could be done oh, with a, uh, um, I don't want to say a highlighter, but the, uh, the plug-in modules they have for IDEs mm-hmm. that try to push you in the right direction for doing things. Yeah. And... I could see that as a concept. I haven't investigated it in depth. And it, my impression is that documentation kind of doesn't get that uh, sort of scrutiny, yeah. which I would like to change. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, why do you think uh, BSD documentation is just so far ahead of everyone else's and not just free BSD, but other BSDs as well? I'm not sure I would say it's that far ahead. I mean, some of the other open source projects have some some really good documentation, uh, but I would say it's among the best. And sure. I think there are several reasons for that. One is just the age. I mean, FreeBSD last year was 20 years old. Mm-hmm. It's been around that long. It's a heritage, and yeah. you kind of don't get to be that old without uh, as a project without having an appreciation for how important uh, the documentation is. And that's a major reason. Uh, sure. Second, of course, is the academic background. Uh, FreeBSD and BSD in general came from the universities and colleges uh, where there's an emphasis on documentation. They aren't worried about getting a, a product out on, on schedule like a, a company is. And so there can be an emphasis on that more so than there would be in a business. Uh, and then uh, my private theory, uh, which I'm not certain it's correct, but I, I think there's some truth to it, is that people who like BSD in general tend to be people who are, are fascinated or at least interested in words and stories and language. And I don't have any evidence for that other than the people I've met. Sure. But I think that's a, a fairly strong uh, I- 
maybe part of it is, is uh, from my perspective, is uh, people that are into BSD like organization and structure. And so yeah. the FreeBSD handbook kind of, it's let's not just have all these various bits of documentation in little loose piles everywhere. Let's compile them into an organized book, <laughs> right? I, I think there's a, a lot to be said for that also. Uh, so, uh, if people wanted to get involved with helping uh, write documentation, uh, what should they do? I've got to show this one too. I'm back to where my drawing, but I only have a couple left. Uh, the first point of contact is the FreeBSD doc mailing list. Yeah. Uh, there's also IRC, uh, BSD docs on FNET. And I've found that most FreeBSD or BSD people in general are directly approachable. I mean, at a conference, by email, by IRC, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need is kind of a, a, an interesting thing. I, I'd say first, uh, currently, we would like to talk to, pe to people with experience in translation with get text and PO files, because most of our translators don't have much experience with that. They've, they've used the, the few translation tools we've had for 20 years and not much else. Sure. Uh, but also, I would like to get people to say, when I find a problem with documentation, something's missing or wrong, I'm pretty much guaranteed that I will run into that again. I mean, the next time I install a system, the next time I, I encounter that particular thing. And it would be nice if I fixed that, not only would I have it fixed for myself the next time I encounter it, but thousands of other people it will be fixed for for free mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i'd encourage people to think of it that way it's like well that uh that misspelling or that error in that man page or in the handbook i keep hitting that and i know it's wrong i will submit a patch or at least contact somebody and say hey that's wrong and then by the next time I get to it, it will be fixed. Yeah. So at a minimum, if you run into a problem in the documentation, submit a PR or mail the doc list, and then either you or someone else can write a patch for it. I, you know, and that gets, to, you know, even just having those PRs there is nice low hanging fruit for someone who wants to get started as a, to work on docs and doesn't know where to start. Well, mm -hmm. here's a list of problems people have found and didn't have time to fix. And maybe you can address right. Some of those. And some of those problems can be, uh, if you have a commit bit, can be quite easy to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have sure. a commit bit or mentor, I, mentor, I should say, yep. uh, they're not always complicated uh, to fix. Yep. Well, yeah. Sometimes it's just a misspelling or, or something. Yeah. Uh, formatting, slight formatting. Issue. I, I saw one today on the mailing list. Uh, a patch I submitted the other day. I spelled uh, country's name wrong <laughs> or a city's name wrong <laughs> for the EuroBSD con. Hmm. Uh, so and I guess the other thing to mention would be the uh, FreeBSD documentation primer, which you mentioned briefly before. But Yes, that, that is our, our book that describes, uh, it has a few places I am looking for additional information. Uh, we don't have a section on writing man pages. There's the MDoc 7 page that covers that. But the FDB primer covers how to check out and edit the docbook XML documents and the, uh, the web pages that are built from them. Yeah. And how to get the tools. It shows the examples of how, how, how the code works and, and mm. such. And, and it's a, there's also the rules, like the 70 columns wide and double spaces after a period. Right, those, those are covered. Yeah. And it does mention in there there's a writing style guide that talks about things like avoid weasel words like would and should. And, and sure. it'll look something like this. Uh, you know, try not to try to be more imperative yeah. and less passive. Voice. Here's an example of a, a bad, like and here's an example of good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and there are there are conventions on how we do certain things and how to indent and yeah. all that. How to mark up uh, a file name versus a device name versus a directory. Right. Uh, Actually, those are the same. Yeah. Well, the directory is slightly different now, but that's yes. true. Uh, but yeah, some of that has changed recently because uh, Gabor mm -hmm. uh, Kovistan, I'm trying to say that properly, he has he did a good job converting us to Docbook XML5, which the tags are slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a welcome change. We really needed that. 
Yeah. Uh, and I guess some of the there's yeah, a, the tags have changed slightly, and some of the the FDP I've updated, and it needs a bit more update. And sometime I would like to get somebody to write a section on writing man pages. Yep. Yeah. Cool. And I guess uh, also it has a the word list. Uh, there are certain things oh, yes. that, uh, like is is file system to... one words or two words or hyphenated and things like that. <sighs> Yeah, I don't. It's two yeah, words, I, according to the word list. I have some disagreements over yeah. that particular one. I think usage has changed somewhat uh, on some of those things. Uh, like for for example, th that's called a compound word, and the uh, the example of that is dark room. There is a dark room, but that's different from what the word dark room implies. Sure. And to me. A uh, file system in two words is a system of files, uh, possibly subdirectories, whereas file system, a single word, is a structure on a disk that is uh, something created by new FS. And I, I think this is, uh, there are areas in documentation that are no less technical and no less subject to bike sheds than anything there is in any programming language. Mm -hmm. And the problem with them in documentation is they don't have the hard rules. I mean, a C compiler will only let you do things a certain way, so there are less uh, ways to, to interpret it. Right. Whereas, Whereas speaking and writing, there are about as many ways as there are people. Yeah, and, there's yeah. and so different universities have different had standards. knock and, down, yeah. drag out uh, bike shed arguments over things that are just amazing. I mean, punctuation. Uh, and so I think we do have some doc committers who are a little insecure about not being programmers because not all people are programmers and doc committers or mm -hmm. uh, either. And I think that's a mistake because it is every bit as difficult to do a clearly, a clearly worded thing that communicates the idea as it is to do a program in any given language. Well, and so, sometimes someone who's not a programmer has that different perspective and is actually able to write the docs better so that people who aren't programmers can understand it. Oh, yes, absolutely. The The end user perspective can be tremendously valuable because sure. you'll find programmers who are just amazed. It's like, I never thought anybody would think to do it that way. And yeah, it doesn't work that way. Or could use yeah. this for or, X, Y, Z that I didn't consider. You know, yeah, didn't, oh, didn't yes. in, in fact, start with uh, this preconception and so on. Uh, I, somebody, uh, uh, the NGINX guys were using Igor on the readmes for their, for NGINX. Oh. And it's like, I, yeah, I guess it could be used for that. It had never occurred to me at the time. And that kind of, uh, multiple input is very valuable. Well, that, that might just be because the creator of NGINX is named Igor. <laughs> Yeah, it could be. I it wasn't. I don't believe it was him, right. but I, yeah, I don't probably, remember yeah, the guy. Max or and somebody, I, but... I should. I feel kind of bad about it because they found at the time a misspelled word in Russian, and I was thrilled about it because to me that's like finding gold. I can add that to the misspelled li words list, mm -hmm. and it will be from then on. It will be found, uh, and I think they got the idea that I was happy they'd made a mistake, and I, I still feel a little <laughs> bad about that because. <laughs> It, it, it was uh, it was an asset for me, right. but uh, I appreciate them using it. And I have heard that uh, I think it was the NetBSD guys were using it for looking at man pages, mm -hmm. which cool. just makes me feel a little more insecure about it because it could do <laughs> it should do a much better job. But like I say, well, take that as a challenge. You know, Anybody yeah, exactly. out there? The best way to get it improved is have more people using it and complaining about what's wrong with it. Yeah. Well, or. Or take the other approach saying, yeah, I don't think any of you guys can rewrite this better than it is right now. I've thought about and you'll that. You'll definitely get two or three for it. So right? far, nobody's, <laughs> nobody's fallen for that. Yeah. Well, cool. Anything else you'd like to uh, mention before we uh, go oh, here? I have one final drawing oh, here. okay. This, this is, it's large and it may require, I'm not sure you'll be able to read it. This is jumping the canyon of redundancy with the monster truck of brevity. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Those are awesome. <laughs> That's really cool. And I just want to say thanks to you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also want to thank Glenn Barber, Brent Benedict Reuschling, and Haraki Sato 
for suggesting me for the commit bit and also for the doc engineering team because that that means a lot but i also want to thank both of you and tj for the excellent work you've been doing on and with FreeBSD, uh, and for inviting me on your show. So tutorial for today, it's gonna to be a little different in that it's not so much a technical one, and uh, guess what, if you're an audio listener, you can even enjoy this, you don't necessarily have to see the screen. So while uh, IRC is the best choice for real-time communication and support on a lot of the BSD projects, and forums are probably most familiar to most users, there's still mailing lists out there. They remain the primary discussion platform for BSD. They're pretty much a part of our culture at this point. They've been around a long time. So this tutorial today, we're going to attempt to help you become acquainted with and how to join and make use of these mailing lists. And we're also going to highlight some specific lists on, of uh, interest if you want to get involved in some of the projects. So it goes without saying, there's many, many different mailing lists. Each of them has their own topic of discussion or purpose for existing. Some are entirely automated, say, for security alerts or maybe commit logs, etc. Others are platform for support and then, of course, code contribution. So uh, take a time, look through some of the following pages, and there's quite a lot. Alan, go ahead and take it away. Yep. So uh, the first one I pulled up is just the list of FreeBSD mailing lists, uh, which is a couple of screenfuls. There's everything from, you know... Uh, FreeBSD-Announce, which is a moderated list where only announcements go out. So it's, you know, FreeBSD 9.2 has been released and things like that. It's very low traffic. Uh, there's stuff like FreeBSD-Apache, which is uh, support for all the Apache-related ports in the ports tree. Or, you know, FreeBSD-Arm uh, for anyone that wants, you know, porting different uh, FreeBSD to different ARM-based platforms. Or, you know, there's one for Bluetooth or things like that. Uh, uh, FreeBSD-Chromium covers any FreeBSD-specific issues to running Chromium, the web browser. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there's tons of them, whether you want to be running FreeBSD on a desktop. Uh, FreeBSD-Docs, like we just talked to Warren about. Sure. If you have questions about uh, documentation, there's one about D-Trace. <laughs> everything you could think of on here. You know, IPF, WPF. One about networking, packages. Mm -hmm. There's lots of stuff there. Uh, automated ones like uh, FreeBSD-Package-Fallout, uh, which sends out emails when there's a compile failure on a port. Uh, so, you know, if you're maintaining a port and you screw it up, you get an email. <laughs> uh, and, you know... There's, I hate those, yes, by the way. I, I know. <laughs> Huge <laughs> list of, uh, I get a lot of this. stuff. Or like the FreeBSD dash virtualization mailing list, which is where a lot of discussion about Beehive, but also about things like VirtualBox and anything else happens. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, also the automated lists like the SVN. So if you subscribe to svn-doc-head, uh, you get every time there's a commit to the documentation head tree, then you get an email of with the commit message and what's changed and so on. Uh, sure. Mostly automated, but... Uh, more common example is if you're going to be, say, running uh, FreeBSD 10 stable, uh, say you're building a product on top of it or just running some servers with it, and you want to know every time they commit a fix so you can tell whether or not you want to suck up that fix right now. You know, is that yep. fix important to me right now or is it something I can just wait to update later? So if you subscribe to that list, you'll get an email every time there's a commit to the stable branch, which is usually pretty rare. Uh, over at OpenBSD, they have a whole set of lists as well. You know, there you have their uh, announced list, ARM, alpha, things like that, but also ports, security announcements, source changes, etc. Uh, their most popular list is the tech list, which is just advanced technical discussions about anything to do with OpenBSD. Uh, NetBSD has a huge set of lists uh, on top of the regular ones like docs, Java, news, jobs even. Uh, they have port specific lists so a list for each different platform and porting netbsd to it so there's you know port dash i386 which uh but the i386 uh, but they also have you know every other uh architecture including like the port to the playstation 2 <laughs> nice um or the port to the vax and so on uh, they actually have more mailing lists about processor architectures than they have mailing lists about other things <laughs> <laughs> they also have uh, regional lists so there's like region-nyc if you're in New York or, you know, region-fr if you're in France, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, Dragonfly has a whole set of lists. 
you know, there's one about the hammer file system, one about the kernel, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and PCBSD has a set of lists as well. Sure, got to have yeah. them. You have your git commit messages, questions about the installer, stuff about PBIs, whether you found a bug with one or if you want to talk with other people developing PBIs because you have a question, mm -hmm. uh, stuff about Warden, Yep. you know, all that stuff. And uh, so there are plenty of mailing lists and most of them have a web interface that makes it easy to sign up and you'll get a confirmation email and it's double opt-in so you won't get subscribed unless you get the email and then click the unique link click that's it. in the email so someone else can't sign you up for the list without your knowledge, etc. Yeah, one thing to note too, you don't really have to pick a password when you do most of these mailing yep. lists. You just take the random one and you don't use it yep. since you're going to confirm everything via email anyway. Yes, and... Uh, I think one of them sends you a monthly reminder that you're on yeah. the list and gives you a link to recover the password if you lost it and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, but mailing lists, uh, a lot of newer users aren't really familiar with the concept or, or how they work, and uh, they run into problems with the etiquette that's common on uh, mailing lists. Uh, so mailing lists uh, are kind of, if you're used to the concept of forums, it's very much the same except for in plain text. And so the biggest one people run into is what's called top posting. So when you reply to an email, <laughs> uh -oh. your reply shouldn't go at the top, but at the bottom under the context of what the other person wrote. Now mm -hmm. think of it, you know, on a web forum, when you post a new message, it goes at the bottom. Because if you're reading the message, you want to read the first one first. And then at the bottom, you see, oh, you're replying to what somebody else already said. If I read only yep. your post without having read the ones before, I wouldn't know what you were talking about. And so with a mailing list, it works the same way, except for, you know, your mail has all of the previous replies in it. And so that's why it's important that you write your response at the bottom. Uh, otherwise, we read into that from time to time. Yeah. We're a little more relaxed about it now because everyone, it seems like too many mail clients now default yes, to top even, posting. Even Gmail defaults to top posting. Yeah. Uh, I think I've given up on my client. <laughs> my client's actually configured depending on which email address I'm using, whether it should top post or bottom post. There you go. Because uh, I have different profiles for different things. Because, <laughs> you know, our customers mostly expect responses at the top, but a lot of times my top post will just say my response is in line and then there's their reply and I've answered, you know, after each of their questions because it just makes more sure. sense if easier to read that way. Uh, yep. One of the other common things is... You know, if you just join the mailing list today, you know, if you just start off by asking your question, it's like, well, somebody asked that question yesterday and I already answered it. Yes. And that was really annoying that you want me to answer it again. Um, so, you know, A, we've seen search for the answer first. Uh, and one of the nice things about mailing lists is that because we post the archives for these online, oftentimes the results you get on Google are from the mailing list. Yes. And it, Google, DuckDuckGo, those sites are your friends. Yep. Please use them before you post. Yes. Uh, and the nice thing there is that you can, by browsing the mailing list archive online, you can actually see the question and the various responses and the whole conversation that happened to answer that question, just like finding an answer on a forum. Uh, so yes, it's always nice if you can search the archive before you ask a question just to make sure somebody else hasn't already asked it. Or yep. even, you know... Even if they asked and didn't get an answer or if they asked something similar, but it's not the same, even referencing that saying, you know, this, it's like this, but it's different because of these things. And that can help sure. a lot. Uh, one of the other things is don't expect an immediate answer. Uh, mailing lists are mostly manned, uh, you know, in the BSD project spans the entire globe. So more than half the people that might have the answer to your question are asleep right now. And so expecting them to answer you right now is a little ludicrous. Um, you know, time zones, holidays, things like that. And also, uh, some people, you know, they have work to do, so they limit themselves to only answering emails so many times a day or for so long sure. each day and things like that. And so, well, like this week, I'm not even checking email until uh, Friday. So I'm busy working on some other stuff. Yeah, and so, you know, sometimes you have to wait a day or two, but you usually get a better answer than you would get somewhere else. Uh, one thing that annoys a lot of people is people that have giant signatures. You know, if, if your signature is... No, ask your... Yeah. 
Come on. Oh. Yeah. If, if your signature is, you know, ask Garrett in two paragraphs and a bunch of legal boilerplate, it gets really annoying and fills up the mailing list, especially since when I reply, I include everything you said. And it yep. just gets annoying. So try to keep it down to like two or three lines if you have to have a giant, if you have to have a signature. Um, sure. And, you know, if you're replying to a message, you want to keep what the, the context of what you're replying to. But if there's a bunch of previous stuff that doesn't matter, you can trim it down to make the email shorter. Um, and also use plain text only. Uh, some email clients will try to default to using HTML and that is bad. <laughs> you know, this is Unix. It's plain text. A lot of <laughs> Unix people still use Mutt and text for email. So yes. And wait. well, just HTML screws up like when you try to paste things with mm -hmm. with uh, special characters and stuff. And the HTML has to deal with those and it, it gets all mucked up. And then you end up with all these weird white spaces and it just gets unreadable. Sure. So, yes, force your client to use plain text. Uh, you don't need fonts and colors and bold. <laughs> Um, also, as Chris mentioned, people are using text-based email clients. So you want to try to keep your lines from being really long. So wrapping your text at like 72 characters, uh, it's a little small, but it's conservative. And it makes sure that uh, your email won't read funny. Because uh, if you go to 80 characters and somebody's mail client does 75 characters, they will see the whole line yeah. and then one word by itself on the next line and then the second line and so on. And it, it just makes it really hard to read, especially when you're pasting something like the output of a command. Uh, avoid large attachments. Uh, some people don't have a lot of <laughs> bandwidth or are checking these on their phone, and they really don't want to download a 20 megabyte attachment. <laughs> uh, if you have a giant large block of text to include, like say the output of your D message, putting that on a paste bin or something like dpaste.com yes. instead of in line in the message can be very helpful. It can separate what you what you said versus what you pasted you know if you paste yep. a d message and then at the bottom add a comment i might not see the stuff at the bottom because it was in the middle of a d uh, uh, a d message so ex putting that off somewhere is good although my one kind of annoyance with that is when people link to stuff on the list and then when you go and find the list on google later and that link doesn't work anymore <laughs> sure but anyway uh the other one is have a meaningful subject uh you know when once the emails got 20 replies and stuff it makes it very handy to be able to tell what's which conversation is which and so on uh if it has a meaningful subject so you can tell what the conversation is about you know i decide whether or not to read certain threads on the mailing list just by the subject so if the subject is about something i'm not worried about i don't read it so if you don't have a good subject that describes what you're looking for uh you won't get it so the subject of just help I'm, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> read your email. <laughs> yes. And, you know, make sure you include technical details, right? If you're, if you're having a problem, it's like, I got this error message. I'm like, well, which error message? <laughs> and what did you do to get it? And, you know, the, the famous one is like you're building a port and you get like the very last output of the error is like error code one. It's like, that doesn't tell me what the error was. <laughs> I need the context. Details. Yes. Details are critical. Yes. Need as many details as possible when you're debugging anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, proofread your message before you send it because, you know, it's harder to read when you have typos and things that don't make sense. Yeah. Uh, the one that always catches me is, for some reason, I, I write not instead of now, which completely changes the meaning of the message. It's like, this yep. is now doing this or this is not doing this. It's like, that's not the same thing at all. <laughs> And uh, one of the, the problems with mailing lists is that they're, because they're public and they have everybody's email address on them, uh, they get harvested for spam bots. So uh, it's usually good to have a, a dedicated email address to use on the mailing list so you can separate out the, the spam. Uh, yeah. You know, cool. Good posting style uh, increases the quality of the discussion and helps everything move along. Oh, awesome. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. Yep. And uh, in the show notes, we link to a bunch of the lists that are particularly useful, like the uh, announce list or the uh, security list on for sure. FreeBSD and OpenBSD and so on, uh, and things like that that will have, you know, are probably the things you're looking for. And also uh, mention that on top of the 
lists at freebsd.org. There's also websites like uh, mark.info that has uh, the mailing archives. Cool. Awesome. Well, great tutorial, and hopefully you guys can start getting on some mailing lists, lurk for a while, and kind of see how these how these work yep. and uh, become useful to you down the road. Yep. Well, we'll be back in just a moment with our uh, weekly news roundup. Next up, weekly news roundup. We're going to start with a little bit of Dragonfly news. We got some uh, new information coming out about Hammer 2 file system, some of the work and notes related to that. I guess Matthew Dillon has posted some updated notes about the development of their new Hammer version. Mm -hmm. uh, the start of a cluster API was committed to the tree, and we got links to design documents, a free map design doc, a changes list, and a to-do list. So any notables in there, Alan? Yeah, uh, so the Hammer 2 design doc just explains all the concepts and features that they're planning to have in hammer 2 uh the free map explains how it'll keep track of free space uh the design changes and issues is a list of things they've had to change since the original design document already there's only a couple things there so far but they're moving up and then they have the list of things on their to-do list like support for hidden directories and and things like that oh, okay. uh nice and uh on the blog there, someone asked, uh, will Hammer 2 be usable by the end of 2014? And uh, Justin Sherrill posted that. Matt says he's planning to have usable, of course not finished, but usable version uh, of Hammer 2 before the end of the year. Although things like master mas or multi-master replication probably uh, won't make it in for 2014. Sure. Well, that's cool. That should be exciting 2015 as well when some of those, mm -hmm. those final features start uh, showing up. Yes, it'll be... Uh, I, I want to look over that design doc a bit more and see what some of the features are planning and, and mm -hmm. see what cool ideas they have in store. Oh, neat. Okay, next up, uh, BSD breaking barriers. We got uh, links to a YouTube uh, video here. Our friend Michael W. Lucas, of course, mm -hmm. gave a talk at New York BSD Con about BSD breaking barriers. So I'll pull a quote from this. What makes the BSD operating system special? Why should you deploy your applications on BSD? Why does the BSD community keep growing? And why do Linux sites like DistroWatch say that BSD is where the interesting development work is happening? So he's going to cover the not so obvious reasons why BSD still stands tall after almost 40 years. Wow. Yep. That's pretty cool. So I guess he has another upcoming talk or webcast called Beyond Security, getting to know OpenBSD's real purpose. Ooh. Sounds neat. I'll have to check that one yep. out. And, uh, Pull quote from that, OpenBSD is frequently billed as a high security operating system. That's true, but security isn't OpenBSD project's main goal. This webcast will introduce system administrators to OpenBSD, explain the project's mission, and discuss the features and benefits. So I guess that's uh, coming up on May 27th, and we're hopeful it'll be recorded. Cool. They better record yes. it. That, that would be a shame not to. So neat. So next up, we have something about a FreeBSD and a Shrew. So what's what's this, this out? This is called Finch. Uh, okay. And apparently, yeah, it's uh, running FreeBSD in a CH root, uh, but apparently it's okay. slightly different than a jail. <laughs> sure. Uh, but it's a way to extend the functionality of restricted uh, USB-based FreeBSD systems, like FreeNAS. Sure. Ah, so yeah, it's um, all the details and some interesting use cases are here up on their uh, GitHub page. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems the general design is when you're on a free NAS, uh, that's running nano BSD. So it's very slimmed sure. down. And sometimes you need the utility of a full free BSD. So this yep. allows you to install a full free BSD in a CH root on your embedded platform hmm. to get access to uh, the tools. Well, that's neat. Then you won't have some of the jail limitations that uh, you would normally have running out of a jail. Yeah. I wonder if you could use that to fire up X on a box like that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Ah, cool. Okay. Well, you'll have to take a look at that. Uh, one yes. mention, we already have a finch in the porch tree, though, oh. so you may have to uh, come up with another acronym for yes. that or something. We'll see. But That's uh, big. Or bump the finch. Yeah. If maybe the finch in the porch tree is out of date. Let's yeah. see. When was this last updated? Loading, loading. Uh... Well, there's been some updates this year mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, 2012 was the last version. Nope, 2014. Uh, Sorry, yep. that one's active. It ain't going away. <laughs> Have to rename your port. That is cool. A neat project. Uh, wish them luck with that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's lots of details here on their uh, on their GitHub page. They have uh, a bunch of use cases, things you might use it for. It looks sure. uh, really interesting. Cool. 
Okay, well, next up, we have our usual little PCBSD blurb we do at the end here. So uh, we have our weekly feature digest. There's a link to that you can check out at the end of the show. A lot of bug fixes that came down the tubes this last week. We've now started doing LZ4 compression enabled by default for mm -hmm. entire Z pools out of box. We have builds a 10 stable rolling at the moment. We're hoping to get a uh, an updated version of that out shortly. And also, we've imported some of the latest GNOME and Cinnamon builds into our Edge package set, mm -hmm. which just went out a few days ago. So if you need something to play with, there you go. That's something to experiment nice. on. So uh, cool. And we hope we'll have some more news on that next week. Uh, working on some neat, tricky stuff right now for PBIs on 10. And we'll see if we can make that into the news at the end of the week. Next up, feedback and questions from you folks in the audience. So we'll go ahead and just dive right in here. We got our first question from uh, Boston asking about dedupe without dedupe. So you want to go ahead and read this one, yeah, Alan? Yeah, he says, uh, hello, is there a way to search for duplicate files on your computer? Uh, he's well aware of the ZFS block level deduplication and compression mm -hmm. features, uh, but he doesn't want to use those. And uh, sure. So in the port tree, there are some tools for doing things like that. Uh, I know there's definitely one that specialize in mp3 files and tries to find them even when the files aren't the same but the song is but um mm -hmm. yeah there's definitely a tool in there somewhere uh i i don't know what it's called off the top of my head but there are ones that will find when there are two files that are the same and give you a list of those so that you can decide which one to delete and which one to keep uh and sure. that can help you save a lot of space well, that's cool hard link those suckers yeah uh there's things like uh yeah you can do hard links or symbolic links or just delete duplicates or whatever you want to do and, and end up saving a bunch of space. Neat. So he says he's got uh, external USB drives and he has to consolidate uh, the content. Uh, so searching for duplicate files and delete them and at the end uh, move everything to one drive for archiving. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, with multiple separate USBs, that's a little more difficult probably. But uh, yeah, you can basically compare SHA 256 hashes of files or something like that and find everything sure. that's... Uh, duplicate and deal with it i don't know Very if there's cool. a graphical tool but uh I'm, I'm sure there's somebody wrote something in Perl or something yeah yeah there's probably a script out yeah, there that just, does that just search for like duplicate or uh, deduplication in the on like uh fresh ports and i'm sure there's a couple of tools yep. as far as which one's best i don't know <laughs> yeah your mileage may vary yes. depending on what you like mm -hmm. well cool Okay, next up, we have a question from Don asking about jail versions. So he says, hey, I know I can use VirtualBox to run different versions of FreeBSD from his base system, but he really wants to use jails. Is it possible to run 10 release on the host and then 10 stable in a jail on that host? Great show, Don. So yeah, Don, um, you can do jails. There's a couple caveats there. Obviously, in the jail, you're not running a kernel, mm -hmm. so you're just going to be executing out of the user land. Um, 10 stable on a 10 release should be possible. It's ABI compatible, so that's uh, that's yep. doable. Where you might run into problems is, like, say, trying to do an 11. Yep jail on a 10 host that's not going to work so yeah. well uh, but if you're uh, generally going the other way yeah. around you're good it, typically you only run older stuff in a jail yeah so yeah. if you want to do something like that you should run the newest one on the host and then yeah. you can run older ones in the jail and it usually works fine mm -hmm. uh running like a nine jail on a 10 host a couple of things won't work like um sockstat or netstat uh the size sure. of that struct changed so the the tool can't read the kernel struct because it's a different mm -hmm. layout um, and so you have to use the the tool on the host system for that uh, but in yeah. general uh, yeah um, Michael Lucas just did a tutorial on how to run FreeBSD 4.11 in a jail on a FreeBSD 10 system uh, to get some old application working so nice so yeah it's definitely doable to run the different versions yeah. and that's how you that's can, how pudre error works right they they run mm -hmm. head that's essentially what they're doing they're running jails and yep. doing package builds in them yeah they run head on the uh on the base system and then they have a jail for each different version they want to build for yep well cool i hope yep. we answered your question there don so next up we have uh let's see Kalahit. something like that Asking about recording. Yes. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and He says he searched the webpage for deals on the details on the technical equipment we use uh, to produce the BSD Now show. Uh, and he said he didn't find any. Yeah, I guess we didn't really put that up on the webpage. Sure. Uh, he says during one of the shows he saw uh, something that looks like Windows. And so he assumed he was using Windows. And he's 
just wondering if you could explain some of the stuff. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm recording on a Windows machine. Uh, I use software called Wirecast, uh, which costs about $500. Uh, and it does the composition. So um, when you're looking at the screen right now, it's actually a transparent PNG file with holes cut out for my face and Chris's face and the website. And each of those is actually a separate feed coming into this compositing app. Uh, it's kind of complicated. Uh, and then uh, the microphones. Well, as far as uh, hardware, uh, it's the Rode Podcast. Yeah, the Rode Podcaster or the microphone that Chris and I have. You'll see they're identical. Uh, and yep. they come with a nice shock mount. And then we just bought a mic stand at like a music store, yeah. right? Just bought a boom mic yep. stand here. And then um, the webcams, we use the Logitech C920. It uh, can do full 1080p. Uh, 1080p and it has an h264 chip in the camera so it does some of the video compression before it has to send the signal over the usb yeah. cable and that's how you can do such high resolution normally sending the raw 1080p video is too much data to try to send over usb to anyway sure. uh, so by doing some of the compression on a chip in the webcam first it allows it to to do it and it also reduces cpu utilization on the machine where you're actually using the webcam mm -hmm. uh, Less encoding. Yeah, and that's one of the requirements uh, to do the full HD on Skype, uh, which is how we pull in Chris's face into my computer to do this. Um, although we're looking at other solutions for that, uh, still, yep. it's the best webcam that you can get for about a hundred bucks. Sure. Uh, I got lucky. I bought mine in Japan uh, for about sixty-five bucks. Although this year when I was there, they wanted a hundred and uh, they wanted eleven thousand yen, which is like a hundred and twenty-five Canadian. So mm. it wasn't a good deal this year, but last year it was. Oh, so. Denny's asking again with the webcam model. It was the C920 yes. HD. Yes, the Logitech C920, which is the highest end one they have. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also like a C720 and a C520 or something, but uh, sure. they are not as good. Uh, depends what you're looking for. Um, I also have a C910, which can mm -hmm. do 1080p, but doesn't do full 30 frames a second at it. So you're better off using oh, the 720p. or something. Yeah. Uh, okay. Slightly older model. The other nice thing with the uh, Logitech, we don't use it, but it has a stereo microphone. So it's actually two microphones, and it samples from both sides, and it's better at canceling out noises from things off camera because the noise mm -hmm. will be louder on one mic than the other versus when you're sure. straight on, it, it won't be. Uh, so it's a nice camera, and it's small and portable. Uh, fits nice on top of an LCD or a laptop. Cool. And uh, the last question from Harry of okay. PEFs. Yep, definitely. <laughs> so uh, first of all, he says, thanks for the great show. He's really hooked on it. Waiting for holidays to be able to look at some of the episodes live. Well, we'll be glad to have you. He has a couple comments about last week's tutorial about PEFs. So he asks, how can you add, uh, can you add mounting directory automatically at boot to the tutorial? So yeah, we can, uh, we can show that. He said he had tried it on a FreeBSD box and had some trouble logging in when he realized it wasn't mounted when he had rebooted. So he had tried doing the automatic mounting after boot with uh, Chris's method mentioned in BSD Magazine, adding a directory name to vardb pefs auto mounts file. That didn't work in his case. Well, that's because that was a file we use on PCBSD. If you're on FreeBSD, you don't have the rc.d script for oh, that. Okay. Um, you can grab it out of our GitHub repo or install the, uh, the PCBSD utils from the ports tree and that'll include it and then you'll have a lo user local at crc.d pefs startup script which will just you know grok that file and do the mounts at boot up cool um, so that's one way around it he also looked at uh, adding the line to etsy uh, rc.local so that works as well um you know of course sure. there's a couple different ways to do yeah. this so take your pick uh, fs tab even yeah <laughs> so. you might want to look at maybe putting that rc script into the port yeah, yeah, maybe we should merge that in. Yeah. That's Yeah, that's something we wrote specific because we have that and then a script which will convert your home directory automatically uh -huh. into a uh, PEFS directory and it'll it'll do all the password file manipulation and all that I mean, stuff well, for even you. Even so. putting that in uh, like user local share examples might be useful. Yeah. But the well, RC script, if the RC.d can... script probably be useful to have in the port. For sure, because you do need a way to auto mount yeah. it easily and that was one easy for us to yeah. do. So. Yeah, I'll talk to Glap. Maybe we can yep. add that to his port. So cool. So he has a follow-up. He says he doesn't want my home directory ah, to be automatically decrypted. His follow-up is I replied to his email with some explanation. Oh. And so the, his, oh, you did? Okay. his response was that uh, I was thinking that when you did PEFS mount is when it prompts for the password, but it's when you do PEFS add key. No. And so yeah, yes. there was, he's mostly just explaining that I was wrong. 
No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't repeat yes. that. Then. <laughs> yep. Well, cool. But yes, for those who are wondering, yes, just mounting a PEFS a file system doesn't doesn't prompt for password or, or right. uh, do any decryption. It's not until you actually add the key or do the login that that ends up happening. Cool. So cool. Okay. Well, hope we answered your question, Harry. So yeah, uh, you know the way you're doing it, rc.local is fine, or grab our script, and I'll see if we can get that uh, upstreamed into the porch tree here soon. Yep. Well, cool. Well, that's the end of our uh, feedback and questions. So we have slots available for future shows. So if you have a burning question or something you just want to ask, go ahead and send it on in. Send it to uh, BSD Now or uh, feedback at bsdnow.tv, of course, and we will uh, we will try and answer that in a future show for you. Of course, all the tutorials are going to be posted in their entirety at bsdnow.tv, so be sure to hit the website. Anything you heard us mention here, you can probably find in the show notes. And, of course, you can watch live Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. We also wanted to give a special mention to the Bay Area FreeBSD users group, uh, bayfog.org. Yes. Uh, special mention, if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a very healthy BSD community there, and they regularly have meetups. I, I know a lot of the IX guys go to that uh, one. Yes, that's uh, so. Craig Rodriguez from the uh, – Yeah. The – from IX uh, wrote in and asked us to to remind people that if you're nearby, you should definitely come out to their uh, user group meeting. And uh, yeah, yeah. Also, he mentioned uh, he's got a video coming out uh, about uh, using uh, Jenkins and Beehive to do uh, continuous integration testing on FreeBSD, oh, nice. uh, which I imagine okay. we'll mention next week. That's a that's probably I think one of the biggest user groups for FreeBSD. Yes, around, I hear so, about uh, it a lot and. It's the yep. only time I've ever thought I wanted to live in the U.S. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so it'd be cool to live there just, you know, to get to go to the meeting all the time. Area. Well, if you are in that area and you can get out to one of the Bay Area FreeBSD user group meetings, go ahead and do it. It's a great community. You'll probably hear some good talks, kind of like a little mini conference every so often. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, also, if you listen to the audio-only version of this week's episode, you're messing out on Warren's fun animations <laughs> of the drawings. interviews. Yes. You may have to go back and see his hand-drawn little yes. uh, illustrations he used, yes. which was pretty cool. Yes, those were funny. And uh, <laughs> just, was. Uh, an extra reminder to uh, send in your feedback. If you have suggestions or questions or anything you want to talk about, uh, make sure you send it into the show. Uh, we need more questions to keep the uh, feedback session going. Sure. And, of course, if you find stories or things you think we should have mentioned that we didn't or yep. you'd like us to talk about, send it there as well. Yep. And we'll, TJ will probably get it and reply to you, so it won't be necessarily me or Alan yep. right away, but uh, he'll be more than happy to get that scheduled for a future show. Yes, that's feedback at bsdnow.tv. Cool. Okay, well, excellent. So this has been a great episode, you guys. Glad you guys are here with us this week, and uh, we'll be back same time next week with another fun, exciting BSD Now. Yeah.